Welcome to Speechless. We're live from the SEC studios in White Bear Lake, also live over SPNN in St. Paul. And we're glad to have you here. Uh, we've got a lot of interesting information. The main subject of the show tonight will be, I have a, a special guest, when we'll be discussing the grazini Rucky uh, trial that's coming up in about 11 days. Uh, but particularly, we're gonna look at the issue of abuse, the children's abuse that took place. We're going to be looking at the uh, psychologist's doctor's own words as to how he described the abuse. And it would be a fascinating look into what's not being said about this case, what is not out in the public forum. Uh, so we're going to take a deeper look into the abuse. We're going to hear the voice of the children and what they're saying and how this is getting lost in the case. And also we're going to look at uh, abuse in the legal setting. How is this defined? Why, it's, why it may be different than what we normally think of abuse as just, uh, you know, the physical abuse. Uh, so I think it's be very fascinating. You're going to get stuff here that the press hasn't covered there. Um, but before we get to that, we do have some issues the press is covering. Uh, one is the Clinton FBI uh, statements uh, exonerating Hillary Clinton for basically being stupid. So we've got a small video on that. But then there was a, a tragedy that uh, struck home here in um, Falcon Heights where a human was killed by a police officer and uh, a sad deal all the way around. I'm gonna have a phone call with Andrew Henderson, uh, the Drukes, uh, dot com, as uh, he has covered a lot of filming the police and have taught people how to get data records and how to protect yourself and to be safe when you're around police officers. And then uh, we will get into um, the main issue <laughs> tonight. So let's, uh, my, my thing with the Clinton thing here, and the FBI is specifically this. Um, why she, she's lying to the public, but the FBI comes out and said she did not lie to us. So we're gonna see a video where Trey Gowdy asks the FBI director, was Hillary Clinton truthful? But the FBI director is answering as to what she said to the public, or is he answering what she told the FBI director? So if she was truthful and answered all these questions affirmatively, different than what she told the public and what she told Congress, then, you know, can the FBI then go after her and say, hey, you know, she's obviously not going to have the charge of lying to the FBI because supposedly she didn't. So there's gonna to have to be depositions, or they're gonna to have to look at the, Congress is gonna to have to look at the depo uh, depositions and see exactly what she said. So let's watch this video and then we'll move on from there. I think Mark classified on her emails either sent or received, was that true? That's not true, there were a small number of portion markings on I think three of the documents. Secretary Clinton said I did not email any classified material to anyone on my email. There is no classified material. Was that true? No, there was classified material emailed. Secretary Clinton said she used just one device. Was that true? She used multiple devices during the four years uh, of her term as Secretary of State. Secretary Clinton said all work-related emails were returned to the State Department. Was that true? No, we found work-related emails, thousands, that were not returned. All right. That was from uh, Fox News, and that was just some of the many questions that Trey Gowdy asked where Hillary was not telling the public the truth. And Trey was asking, this is what she told Congress. Was that true of what she said to the FBI? What the FBI found, was that true? And he said no. Um, so it'll be an interesting deal. Um, Congress is looking at impeaching the FBI director for not charging her and they're being derelict in his duty to uh, perform justice. 
All right, do we have uh, Andrew Henderson on the line? Have we called him yet? I'm looking for someone from the studio. Have we called him yet? Okay. Andrew, are you there? Yes, I am, sir. How are you doing tonight? Good. Thank you very much. Doing fine. Well, it's sure. been, a, it been a busy day for you, hasn't it? It has. It has. I've been dealing with uh, a lot of stuff going on here in the cities uh, ever since uh, last night. I haven't slept in over 24 hours. But oh, really? And stuff done. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, so what have you been doing? You've been covering the shooting. Who was the young man that was uh, uh, killed? Uh, the young man, his name is, uh, wait one second here. I should have this. Really I, top I should have head, had it, I too. I, I apologize. <laughs> so, so much going on that... Uh, Kind of forget that. Uh, Mr. Castile. Okay, that's right. Um, yes. So what have you, you know, what have you been doing over this last 24 hours? What have you been looking for? What have, where have you been? Uh, well, I have uh, been scouring the Internet for, for as much information as possible, uh, talking with different activists all around the Twin Cities um, and the state. Um, I've been to the, uh, the uh, uh, police department uh, for the um, St. Anthony, you know, St. Anthony Village, um, seeing what I could find there and, and, you know, doing a little protest over this. Um, they, they really didn't like me there. I was writing with chalk outside of their police department, and they, they On the side quickly walk. made it known that I was not welcome, and they, they erased all my, my nice little chalk, uh, chalk words for them. Sure. So you can, obviously you've been through the process, you can write chalk on sidewalk and that's okay. Perfectly and, legal, First and, Amendment right right yeah, there. And they have every right to take it off too, right? Sure, yep, <laughs> so, yep. Okay, uh, so what, what, what have you found out uh, about this case or what has drawn your interest uh, to this? Well, a couple things have drawn my interest to this. Um, first of all, I, I pretty much grew up in the area where this happened, the, the, the Como Park area, you know, right by the state fairgrounds. I've been up and down that road thousands of times in my life, literally thousands. Um, that, that street right there is, is a revenue generation hotspot right. for, for, for the uh, St. Anthony Police Department. They, they hand out more municipal citations there than anywhere else. But it's People, a very long you know, block and straight and wide. Yes, yes. I mean, there's there's no no stoplights or stop signs for a long time. They they hide out. They often get people for no headlights, no taillights, something like that. I myself have even been pulled over uh, on that stretch, <laughs> very very close to where this incident happened. Why for, am I not surprised? A out. <laughs> so yeah. Um. So yeah. I mean that. that that's what drew my attention. Um, and then second of all, uh, I talked to Diamond, the, uh, the passenger in the vehicle. I, I didn't talk to her, but I had someone else talk to her for me. All right. And, and, and threw her a video and a picture of, of the officer that, that pulled me over. And she confirmed that that was the officer that also pulled her over. Okay. So... That's that. Uh, the officer's name has not been released yet, um, but but uh, Diamond says that this is the officer that 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 pulled her over and 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 shot Mr. Castile. So in one sense, this you're you're saying this is kind of a, a spot for the police officers or St. Anthony to gain revenue. Yes, uh, very much so. And that's their intent. So they're not really looking at potential. Well, an assumption they're not really looking at protecting and serving, but to really try to find any way they could um, get some revenue. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, you know, and another thing that really struck me about this is, is you know, the, the, the Second Amendment right issue. I mean, us, us as human beings have a natural right to protect ourselves, you know what I mean? Right. And especially this gentleman, he had, you know, the constitutional right under the Second Amendment he had his 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 permit to carry legally. Mm -hmm. You know, he was he was not a criminal. He right. had no criminal record. He worked at a school with children. You know, this is a stand up individual. And, you know, there is no reason that a police officer should shoot someone for, for simply exercising, 
you know, their their God given right to to defend themselves. You know, right. he he wasn't aggressive towards this officer. As 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 far as I know, his 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 weapon was always holstered. He he never pulled it out of the holster. You know, he was he was reaching for his his concealed carry permit uh, when asked. It, that's that's so far as the narrative. Mm-hmm. You know, it it, it didn't he, seem he like was he asked, was being argumentative or anything like that. He he was asked to produce the concealed carry permit. Uh, yes, that's what Diamond says. Is that that the officer asked asked to see it? Okay. And un, you know, under Minnesota state law, if an officer asks to see your permit, you have to produce it. Right. So he was reaching for that, and and according to Diamond, the officer just pulled his gun and and, and shot five bullets into him. Just for actually, wow, uh, doing what he was ordered to do. Right. Uh, so something went wrong with uh, protocol there. It seems to me. I, I mean, it That's seems all. to me if you if if you know, and I think all police officers, and this is what I've been told, assume when they pull somebody over that it's a felony stop, mm-hmm. and that they assume that there's a gun on everybody. And yep. so, when somebody tells you that they have a gun, I mean. Why should that, that shouldn't raise any more alarm than if somebody says, I don't have a gun. Right. I mean, I mean, there's, there's, you know, thousands of people in, in, in Minnesota carrying guns every single day, you know, and, and these, these legal gun owners that have their permits are not the ones committing crimes are not the ones right. murdering people. You know, these aren't the people that we have to worry about. And if the, if the, someone's going to shoot a police officer, they probably would do it before they get to the car? Yeah. And, right and, as and, they're there? And, yeah, they, they, they wouldn't notify the, uh, the, the, the officer that they have a gun. You know, if, if, if I was going to murder somebody, I, I, I probably wouldn't, you know, give them a, a, a warning of, of what I have and where it is and all that. Right. Uh, but even if somebody did, mm-hmm. as this guy did, I would still as a police officer, be concerned and be attentive. You sure. know, I wouldn't yeah. have a trigger finger, though. You no, know, absolutely not. S- so- something went wrong. Yeah, you know. I, it, 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 it might be his training. I mean, many officers are trained to, you know, think that they're in danger, you know, all the time. But last year was the second safest year in, in, in American history for police officers. I mean, it just keeps getting safer and safer. So that that the, the, there there really is that, that there really is no 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 reason to, to 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 fear the average citizen. I mean, I I can understand if you're going into like a you know a bank robbery or something like that, but the average citizen yeah. is, is 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 very unlikely to harm a police officer. Well, and this police officer, to be fair, wouldn't know he was an average citizen until he heard, "I have a permit to carry." Right. You know, then you would know this person is average and probably above average, you right. know, going through that type of class. And yep. here's a here's a person who's been trained in the protocol of what to do when stopped by a police officer. And there's mm-hmm. a police officer who's been trained in the protocol of how to handle that type of situation. And it seems right. to me that the police officer didn't handle the situation correctly. I, I think personally I would have had the guy get out of the car, keep his hands up, have him get out of the car, and then search him. Right, you know, right, right. Take right. his weapon away just for officer safety for a little bit. And, right. you know, make sure he has all his, you know, his, his proper credentials and, and, you know, complete the traffic stop, give him back his weapon, and, and, and let these people be on their way. Right. Well, I, I also think something else is going on here uh, uh, besides your point that you're making there in the Second Amendment right. Um I also think the courts are kind of complicit in this in uh, lowering the standard for what's required for a search. This is a tail light out, you know, and yes. police officers are going and looking for drunk driving. They're looking mm-hmm. for uh, drugs. They're, they're trying, they're searching, they're doing an investigation even with the tail light out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, they're looking for, for cash, anything that they can, you know, find, um, you know, uh, stuff for civil asset forfeiture. Right. I mean, this, this, this goes pretty deep. Yeah, and, and that's, and, and so what the court's saying, 
you know, stop anybody. You don't need a warrant anymore. You can check later to see if they got warrants out for their arrest, you know, and it, oops, if you made a mistake, so what? I mean, that's our Supreme Court two weeks ago came down with a decision like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, I mean, with, with the police officers knowing that the courts have given them a lot more leeway, uh, right. more of this type of thing I think is going to happen. It, sure. Yeah. Just, I mean, uh, especially if they see a, you know, a, a young black male, you know, that, that, that they think, you know, looks a little different and might have, you know, some, some, some plant matter, or, you know, something illegal on them. Mm -hmm. it, it, it raises the chances of a, of, of a search being done. Right. Yeah. And from everything I can tell in that video that I'm not going to show, uh, maybe, maybe later, but Mm -hmm. it, the guy looked like a just a very clean cut, straightforward guy. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, like I said, he worked at a school. Right, St. Paul Public you know? Schools. Mm -hmm. So we thought it was rough at St. Paul Public Schools, but this mm -hmm. it's just a tragedy to say this. Right. And and Diamond's uh, composure was uh, unbelievable. Oh, definitely. I mean, I I don't think I could have handled myself in a situation. No. But no. but there is one thing I want to bring up about. Okay. Uh, uh, about Diamond's uh, treatment, she was actually uh, uh, transferred to the uh, uh, Roseville Police Department, held there without food, water, and without access to to legal counsel. Oh, hours. really? Yes. For how long? Uh, I believe it was until like five a.m. And she didn't get any food. And when did the shooting take place? Oh, it was early afternoon. Uh, I want to say, yeah, it was evening-ish is, okay. is, is what I think. Um, but, yeah, I mean, so she was held for, for hours upon hours, you know, and her daughter. I mean, you know, a little girl was, well, was, was held. And, and I know they have food there, and mm -hmm. it's oh, ready. Yeah. And for them not to get any, of course, you being in uh, jail or being housed in a holding cell, don't know what your rights are. You're not expecting this, so you don't know to ask for food. But you shouldn't have to. That's something they should be uh, very well aware of. Sure. I mean, yeah, you're in their custody. You know, you're their responsibility for that short period of time. And so she asked so, to see a uh, call an attorney, but they wouldn't give her one. Yeah, she she was not allowed to call anybody. No, you know, she couldn't call family. She couldn't call an attorney. Nothing. Wow. Until yeah. she got out? What's that? Until she got out? That, that's and, yep, not yep, at all. Yep, and no, they no. interrogated her during this time, right? Right, right. Yeah, so they were asking her questions, and they, they and from her words, they, 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 they wanted her story to match their story. And uh, okay. she would not comply with that. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right. A anything else? You know... I, I suppose I'd like to close on, on, on one simple thought, that if you or I were to shoot another person, yeah. we'd immediately be arrested, and our names would, would be all over the news, and, and it would be public information almost instantly. Mm -hmm. but, but for some reason, if you have that, that, that badge on your chest, you know, your name isn't released until your employer, you know, the police department, can figure out some kind of legal defense before they release your name. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's, 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 that's a huge double standard and shows just an incredible lack of transparency. Well, you're right, and it it's also shows how our uh, Constitution has been turned on its head where Definitely. the citizens are to have the rights and the government's to be restricted. Uh, where we're supposed to know everything that's going on and the government's not supposed to know everything that's going on. So right. total, total turn on its head there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, yeah, thanks again for having it. me on your show. I, I, I totally appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate the work you're doing out there and uh, trying to help people protect themselves. Awesome. Well, have a good night, All sir. Right. You too. All right. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Um, if you did not see... Diana Longry's show last night, uh, Off the Record News, which, by the way, there's no such thing as being off the record. Um, 
Communities United Against Police Brutality was on the show, and there is a petition out there to try to, in, in Minneapolis, to get on the ballot uh, that police officers have and pay for their own insurance. Uh, because when these type of things, you get police officers with histories of abuse and uh, going beyond, uh, and if they paid for their own insurance, some of these insurance companies would say, hey, uh, no, uh, this person has a record, we're not gonna insure them, or we're gonna raise their rates to a level that may be un uh, unaffordable. But right now, most cities have insurance for, or they cover their insurance themselves. In other words, they're self-insured, is what I wanna say. They're self-insured, so the city just covers the cost of whatever uh, lawsuit settlements they have, uh, which can be a lot, but uh, I think it's kind of a good idea that police officers have some, uh, have to pay for some coverage themselves or the city has to pay for the coverage themselves uh, so that there could be another form of checks and balance uh, on our government. And for those officers that have a record, a history of uh, misbehaving, you know, it's another form of accountability. All right, uh, I got one update on the Grazzini Rocky case before we bring on our guest here. Um, and that's the issue of the uh, informer papyrus. Um, we talked about it last week, how that one was issued in February for Grazzini Rocky and uh, for Sandra. And the, that was for a year that it was to last. And then when they were in court uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, the judge ordered a new, that Sandra do a new uh, informer papyrus form. And so they turned it in and we haven't heard anything yet. Now, here's the importance of that. The Judge Aspaugh, Karen Aspaugh from Dakota County has not issued whether Sandra has her informer papyrus, and the trial's coming in 11 days, and there is no, they haven't received the evidence that the other side has against them, against Sandra. It's amazing uh, that this is going on. This should not be going on. If the, the judge should have issued right away whether uh, Sandra gets the IFP or not. And so the, the state is withholding the evidence until the money's paid. Well, that should not not be the way it works. The evidence should be given and then the state should uh, send a bill. And that's not happening. All right, so let's play our selling out video and uh, we'll bring on our next guest. Selling out is easy to do, it's not so hard to find a buyer for you. When money talks, you're under its spell, ah, but what do you have when there's nothing left to sell? Selling out I'd rather call it compromise Is easy to do Sometimes you have to close your eyes It's not so hard Being rich is no disgrace To find a buyer for you Put who on your shoes and join the race When money talks It has a very soothing voice You're under its spell It's up to you to make the choice Ah, but what Before do you, you have know it, When there's be nothing, nothing left to, to sell? sell. Break the rules People who try are fools When you get older Maybe then you will see I've always found ideals Don't take the place of meals That's how it is And how it will always be It's so nice to have integrity I'll tell you why if you really have integrity, it means your price is very high. So remember when you start to preach and moralize, 
that we all are in the game and brother its name is compromise it's so nice selling to have a I'd rather call it compromise All right, welcome back. I have with me our guest, uh, Lynn Marie. Hello. Thank you for coming on. Now, you're a family court advocate, yep. family law advocate. Yes. And uh, you kind of been through the court system, seen what's going on, but you've been doing research on the uh, Sandra Grazzini Rocky case in the runaway children. Yes. But you've taken a specific angle on this, so why don't you kind of describe what that angle is. The, I was hearing the stories in the news about the Grazzini Rocky case and it seemed like there was a lot of red flags and things that were missing. So I decided to read and research into the case. Um, I'm familiar with the court system. I've been through it. I work with parents all across Minnesota. When I was going through some of the records, it seems like the abuse is being overlooked and it's really incredible that children can say we are being abused, we're afraid of our father, these horrible things are happening to us, and yet the court's response is, you're a liar, you're, you're brainwashed. That shouldn't be happening at all. Um, there has been an ample volume of documentation that these children clearly were being abused. The oldest girls that ran away, their story has not changed one time in all the years. They have been crying out and asking for help, and the system has failed to acknowledge, to investigate, and fail to protect them. And that shouldn't be happening. When the court is failing to protect these children, it puts all of our lives in danger. This can happen to any of our families. These judges are taking the law into their own hands. And I really think that the Rocky children need a voice and that we need to focus on the abuse that is happening and protect them. Yeah, so, I mean, you've read the research from Dr. Gilbertson. Yep. And you really looked into what he was describing, and the court kind of misinterpreted, well, Dr. Gilbertson was looking for one outcome and basically ignored the evidence, acknowledged but ignored the evidence that the kids were saying. Dr. Gilbertson was appointed to be a parental alienation um, expert in the Grazzini Rocky case. Now what's interesting about this is the court was well aware that the children were making claims of abuse. They decided they were not not going to investigate the abuse but instead blame the mother, Sandra, for parental alienation. Um, I found a document online where Dr. Gilbertson wrote a letter to guardian ad litem Julie Friedrich. When you read the work he's doing with these children, he's not treating anything related to the mother's relationship with the children. He's addressing the children's fear of their father, and he's addressing abuse. This whole work he's doing has nothing to do with anything Sandra's done wrong, but yet he's claiming she's brainwashing the children. So what, what are some of the examples of, and, and how did he say things that, revealed this to you. Now, uh, this letter I have here is from February 6, 2013. Um, Dr. Gilbertson wrote this to the guardian at litem, Julie Friedrich. I can read you very clear what he says. Um, after working with the children, he says there are two prevailing emotional themes these children speak to. One is fear of being in the presence of their father, given what they alleged to him being an angry and violent opinion. I mean, angry and violent person. Um, he goes on to say that the children's fear issue needs to be addressed directly and it can only happen when there is exposure to the specific feared object, situation, or person. That is the father. Um, and he also makes a mark that alludes to that there's a family history of violence that happened even before the custody proceedings. Uh, Gilbertson says, I would work with Mr. Rucky to have him present a certain structure and accounting of his own behavior. 
while the family was intact, and that would acknowledge the volatile family history and express his em empathy for the children's painful memories. These children are being forced to reunify with an abuser. They're put in a situation where they have to go face to face with somebody they fear. That in itself is traumatic and abusive. So, I mean, he says right in there, a uh, volatile family history. Yes. Painful or, or painful yeah, memories. And, and painful memories. It's abuse. So, a a doctor should look at those and and address those with the children, rather in some reunification setting, uh, rather than hey, you get the kids. If a child is um, expressing fear of their father and they had made, the children made numerous abuse allegations, the first thing a therapist should be doing is assessing the children's safety and getting them in a safe place. The first response should not be force the children to reunify with an abuser. Um, yeah, very good point. Yeah, these, and these children's stories have never changed. They're very specific on their allegations of abuse and accompanying what the kids are saying, mm -hmm. there's other collateral evidence. We have voicemails from David Rucky. There's one where there's allegedly six gunshots, one for each family member. Connected to that, we have um, seen still footage online of David stalking Sandra. And when he drives by her house, he makes the shape of a gun with his hand. That's very threatening. It's almost like he's going to carry out what he said. We have voicemails of David berating and yelling at his son, very threatening. We have reports from neighbors that this man was frightening and that he was mistreating his family. There is so much evidence of abuse in this case, I don't see or understand why the court's response is put the children with the father and not protect the children. Okay, and, and specifically related to the children, Okay, because there you're talking about an OFP was put yes. out on, on, on David Rocky uh, against seeing the children and, and Sandra, right? And so, but specifically, what kind of uh, abuse have you heard of or research that David had against the children? I mean, the gunshots was one. The gunshots was one. Um, you can't really separate abuse of a parent and a child because they're in the same house. A child sees their mother get hurt or abused, it's gonna cause fear in them. Also, um, in a lot of abuse situations, an abuser, if he doesn't have access to his victim, he will use the children as a weapon. So you can't really separate the two. Um, we have also had released a, a number of CPS reports made on the Rocky children. There was one where the son claimed that his father had put a gun to his head. Um, we have audio footage of the daughter talking about dad's verbal, physical abuse, inappropriate sexual comments that she had witnessed um, bruises on her mother. We have voicemails where the father is, in his own words, berating his son, um, threatening him, swearing at him trying to get him to do things that he didn't want to do. He wanted his son in hockey, his son wanted to do acting. That response should not be yelling at, swearing at your children. Well, I, I mean, you know, when you, you talk about just that specific one, mm -hmm. you know, David Rocky was, uh, my understanding, very involved in, in, in the Lakeville Hockey Association or hockey in that area. And, um, if I remember correctly, the president of of that association or an officer, and so he's very connected into that. Your your child has to be involved in hockey in, uh, in the area in order to be in an officer position, uh, and with his son then not wanting to play hockey, he loses that position. He, he loses that position, and from an abuse standpoint. Um, He's disrespecting the children's boundaries and their sense of self. He's pushing his that, will on that child. And, and that's key because I want to bring up a distinction because I, I have a, a relative. Uh, people in my family played football, and we liked football. And uh, 
but one of uh, a relative's children didn't want to play foot, played football, great punter, but didn't want to play football, wanted to do, go into art, painting, you know, sculptures, whatever. And, you know, after discussion, you know, is this really what you want to do? You're, you're pretty successful at this. And then the reality was this, this is who he is. This is what he wants to do. And so they let him go down that path. Well, he's a really good artist. <laughs> you know? I, I mean, so it, it's about the child. The parents help form the, the child, but they don't pressure them into a mold. Don't break them down. I mean, it, right. so some of the comments in the voicemail were like, you're going to regret this for the rest of your life. There is denigrating comments about um, Sandra to the children. Abuse is not always physical with bruises. The, the, the um, verbal, the mental, the psychological it has lifelong scars. It causes lifelong damage. And um, there's actually been studies shown that says that children who go through emotional abuse is just as damaging as a soldier going through a war field. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, that, that kind of brings up a, a, an issue here as to what is abuse? How is abuse looked at in the legal setting? You know, we, we think of hitting, but you mentioned the emotional, but w in the legal setting, how is abuse considered? Abuse actually is a pattern of controlling and um, controlling behavior and threatening behavior. It's, um, it's threats, it's violence, but it doesn't always have to be a physical or a touch. It could be like um, withholding the finances. It could be like a, the emotional. Um, but what is key is that this behavior is recurring over time and the abuser is doing these threatening actions to get somebody to do something they want to control, to gain power. So it's abuse is, um, happens even after the relationship ends. Just because you leave your abuser doesn't mean it, it goes away. And I think the court system has trouble recognizing abuse and seeing how it continues after separation. They tend to say this is a high conflict family. Right. But that's not what's going on. It's the, the abuse that happened in their marriage is continuing. And a lot of times it's taken out on the children. Well, there's, there's kind of a, a certain amount of control that a parent needs to have over their children. Uh, and that and that isn't abusive like you know we get we got to get off the bus now or we got to get out of the car now or uh, you know we're going to the grocery store we have to go places and the kids don't want to go yet th there's that type of controlling you know but some parents do handle it better than others you know I mean one thing I learned is you just give the child a lot of warning uh, you know a lot of leeway we're leaving in 15 minutes get done what you need to get done. We're leaving in five minutes, just this constant reminder so that they're ready to go. And then describing the behavior, but some parents are, we're leaving now and you're taking a child out of a, a play setting or whatever and they're just, what, I haven't dealt with this. <laughs> I'm not ready to go, you know. So there's a certain amount of control parents need to have that isn't abuse, but it's still control. Con uh, controlling a parent in a normal setting, you have boundaries and the child has some kind of say. Mm -hmm. It's respecting the child as an individual. In an abusive situation, the abuser is dominating that person. Mm -hmm. They're breaking down their will. They're doing things to put fear in that person and that their control is based on fear, whereas a, a normal situation, the control is more of a discipline or a guidance. Okay. Well, and that I don't see that the courts really want to draw a distinction between those two because they'll use a normal situation and call it abuse and they'll use an abnormal situation and not call it abuse. I, I mean it's just a it's a really mixed bag. That's what I see out there. The court to um, generally the guardian at items they have they're doing things that guardians shouldn't be doing. They're having like this psychologist in um, Sandra's case Dr. Gilbertson he shouldn't be directing parenting time and, and, and telling when she can see the children or not. His job is just to treat the children. So we're having problems too with um, professionals doing more than what they're supposed to be doing and professionals who are not trained in abuse 
treating these situations. So Dr. Gilbertson then, you know, came up with, acknowledged that the kids were being abused. They were stressed out. There was a problem. Chose, from what I hear you saying, chose not to deal with it or in a, in a right manner, but chose to then give the children over to the abuser. Uh, and, and, but at the same time acknowledged that this abuse is going on. He, uh he, you read this letter and it sounds like he's acknowledging the abuse that's going on, but when he goes to court, he's not talking about abuse. And this actually gets one step okay. worse. So there was a court hearing in February 2013 where the children were, uh, um, Dr. Gilbertson wanted the children present. So he actually had the children in the courtroom listening to some of the testimony because he wanted to convince them that they needed to reunify with their father. Now. Um, the children were given an opportunity to st speak to Judge Knutson, and they did tell him about the abuse. That transcript was sealed, so we can't see what they said, but we know that they said that. Now, that family court hearing was in the morning. At 1.30 the same day in the afternoon, David Ruckey had um, a criminal hearing because he had violated a no contact order. He had seen his children when he was supposed to have no contact. He would shown up at their school. so. Dr. Gilbertson is pushing for reunification even when there is this problem going on and when he has already violated a no contact order. That should not be happening at all. I, I, I just find that really, really strange because I know so many men who have done the smallest thing, like after a year text, I want to see my son. and. They got to go 14 days, you know, in the workhouse. Uh, they they go they go to they get arrested. They get incarcerated. Uh, and here's somebody that violates an OFP aggressively. I mean, this is not a light violation of an order for protection. This is I'm aggressively violating it, and there's nothing. I I, I mean this the, this is the courts being abusive. Then. Yeah, and, and they turn out to be the abuser. Sandra, by all accounts, was a loving stay at home mom. She was the children's primary caregiver. The children have begged and cried to see their mother. She's the one who's being punished while the person who has egregiously violated the order of protection, who has stalked the family, um, who has instilled such fear in the children that they don't even want to see him. He's going unpunished. I mean, that's not how the legal system should be working. If this is what the family court feels is success, we have a serious problem. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't think that they think this thing is a success. I, I guarantee you that. But th there's something else wrong that's going on here in that the transcripts of this meeting of the children and the judge are sealed. I mean, that's a lack of transparency. So. Sandra is being, not being able to see her children based on testimony that she did not hear, she did not see, and she can't rebut. She can't challenge anything. But it's almost like if we understand what the children did say to the judge, it's like the evidence is in Sandra's favor, but the judge doesn't want people to know what the children said because then he'll look bad. Yeah, and um, Samantha actually, she had a video testimony that's on YouTube and she specifically said that the court called me a liar when she raised concerns about abuse. It's, it's like the court is pushing their agenda over the protection of the children. It's, it's a failure to protect. And we don't know what the court said that she was a liar about. You know, so David Knutson can go, Judge David Knutson can go and say, hey, uh, Samantha, you're a liar, but okay, well, wh what did I lie about? So it just ends up being this name calling, and we don't know what the facts are that David Knutson says she's lying. And then there can't be any cooperation of, of, of witnesses that could affirm or deny what Samantha said. I, I think there is a cooperation of witnesses. Samantha's story has never changed when she's talking about the abuse and the things she has gone through. 
all these years, they have never changed. And when you look at abuse as a pattern of behavior that continues, you can tie in some of the other things David Rocky has done with his criminal history, with the neighbor filing an order for protection because he was so afraid of him. The neighbor was so afraid of him, he put security cameras around his house. The road rage, all of these behaviors are the same types of behaviors that would manifest in the home. Well, the, the road rage, why don't you describe that? Yeah, David Rocky had a road rage incident in 2015. Um, he had uh, an altercation with somebody on the road, ended up following this guy into a Cub Foods parking lot, waited for this guy to get out of his car and actually brutally beat him. And he was charged with um, disorderly conduct and was put into anger management. He had been actually court ordered into anger management at least three to four times before. And the really horrific thing about this is you can see this guy is violent. He's on probation. When the girls are recovered, he's given custody of these children and they're saying my dad is violent, he's angry and the courts are saying we don't believe you, even though he has this criminal history. Yeah, and so Sam's, Samantha has been consistent, but there isn't the ability for anybody else to, well, at least Sandra, to come and say, Here's here's my story in in relationship to that. I mean, there's no cross examination. There's no. It's just a secret hearing. It's a secret tribunal. It's it's not public, and there that gives the judge a license to do anything they want. I mean, that's that's where I see, you know, the real one of the real tragedies in this is that the children's. Even David's constitutional rights are being violated by that because of the lack of transparency. Yeah, and, and while we're talking, something else came to my mind is that the children are, are claiming that they're abused, but their behavior is also showing abuse, and that's an important distinction. Um, we have reports that came in about um, the girls when they were at staying at the ranch. They apparently had nightmares. They didn't want to be touched. Um, they were fearful when the door rang that their dad was coming to get them. Um, even some of the guardian at Lightroom reports for the children that were in David's custody, they still had a lot of anxiety. They still had fearful and avoidant behaviors around their father. You can't make up those kind of behaviors. They go, they're a symptom of the abuse and it's a lot of the times people have these behaviors unconsciously. They don't know that they're shrinking away or they can't control that they're having nightmares. So the court is really missing a lot of red flags here. And in not only are this, the um, hearing secret, but they're also covering up a lot of the evidence we have. And instead of looking at the abuse and investigating, they're blaming the mother wrongly for this. Well, I, I find there's some other areas that um, uh, of a that are is not being told ab about this case, and, and that this isn't the first time the kids have run away. Right. Um, this after the September seventh, two thousand twelve hearing, the children um, attempted to run away again from their father's home uh, and from their relatives. How many of them did? All four of them. Um, and and the old uh, the oldest boy didn't. The oldest boy was, um, he was the first one to live with the father, but initially he did make abuse allegations. Um, the other interesting thing is if you read the court transcript from September 7th, it says that they, the court wanted to facilitate the move as quick as possible because they were afraid that the children would come up with alternate plans of their own. So it's almost like the court is acknowledging there's a risk these children are going to run. <sighs> Uh, that's just, uh, it's amazing. So, huh, in, instead of, instead of talking to the children, um, being patient with them, gathering their res uh, respect, uh, they, they're being forceful and cramming it down their throat, expecting them to react negatively against what you're doing. That seems like a recipe for disaster. Yeah, and Dr. Gilbertson also alludes to that aggression in his letter. And it's 
this is something that's really traumatic on children. It's going to cause lifelong damage. These are small children we're talking about here. Um, Dr. Gilbertson says in his letter that we need to take an assertive stance from the court that to order these children to attend a face-to-face -face session with their father. I have never heard of a court ordering a child to do anything. Um, he then goes on to say that he believes the presence of the court, a bailiff nearby in my own presence, and then the meeting with their father, in my opinion, would deal with the fears they have real or imagined. Um, wait, 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 whoa. It's like all of a sudden, if we manipulate this scenario where we have this overwhelming presence of authority that in a matter of minutes, all these fears will go away. <laughs> whether whether real or not. Yeah, and that's just bizarre. If these children have the, have the fear that needs to be looked at, it, how how they translate a child's fear of a father to brainwashing makes no sense whatsoever. This is her, her, this is abusive towards the children. So Dr. Gilbertson met with the children uh, how often? At, at this point in this letter, it said um, in uh, six different occasions. Okay. So uh, how long were those occasions? How long were the meetings? He doesn't elaborate. He just says that the children were resisting, and his idea of resisting is they're talking about abuse, fear of their father, and family issues. Wow. Uh, okay. And so he didn't, it sounds to me like he didn't deal with it. He didn't deal with, okay, the kids are here in this situation. Here's the scenario. This is where they're at. He didn't talk them through that unless he was purposely trying to change their minds, you know? Right. I mean, I can, I can see him asking, well, why do you think that's abuse, you know, or versus, you know, saying, well, that's not abuse, <laughs> you know? It, it just... Reading that letter, it just it's just very, very... It's very, very troubling. And um, I don't... There's no positive result that has come out of this. this the crisis has gotten worse. And to this day, apparently, um, Samantha Rocky is missing. And nobody knows where she is. I mean, it's, I apparently, um, from what I've heard, they're trying to um, get her to appear in court as a witness, and they haven't been able to track her down. I mean... And have they been able to find the phone? I mean, they know where David is. They know is. where David is. They don't know where Samantha is. So if this child is doing so well after all the court interventions, shouldn't she be working and in the public and, and be very visible? The fact that she, we're, there's still an unknown, that she's still kind of missing out there, implies that something is seriously wrong. Yeah, it definitely does. Uh, so it, it, this would basically be the third time she's ran away. I wouldn't say she's ran away. I would just say that her whereabouts are unknown. Okay. So the four kids ran away first, yep. and then the two girls ran away. The two girls ran away second because the youngest children were held at school. They ran, went to the school to get the kids. The kids oh, are really? being transferred from the care of their maternal aunt to the paternal. Okay. So... Um, and then with this, they're, they're, they never changed, that nothing changed in everything and uh, as far as what they've said. But they, they went to California then for a month or so for reunification with their dad or, or reunification camp or? They went to a reunification therapy in California. I'm not sure how that therapy works. I do know that typically children who have any kind of history of abuse or trauma, therapy is a, a slow process. It, 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 you don't recover a child in a month. It takes time to build time with the therapist and to work through the issues. Okay, well, I would think it'd take longer. Yeah, so yeah. Are, they, are they supposedly doing some therapy now too or? I haven't heard if they're doing therapy or not, but you can imagine it, it would probably be needed. But given the situation that the, they're placed in an abusive home, that the adults have failed them, you can't imagine that they would want to open up to anyone at this point. The system has shown time right. and time again, if you talk about abuse, we're not going to listen to you. Right. And that basically they've been told you're the problem. 
and the, and the, and the identified abuser has gotten away with it. And whatever you say, we're not going to give any credibility to it. Right. And help you deal with what may have happened or may not have happened, but we're still not going to let you help you deal with it because we're just not going to believe what you say. That doesn't work. And I think, too, I want to say one of the most telling things I've seen out of everything I looked at this case is the last picture on um, Sandra's youngest daughter's Facebook page was a picture with her mom. It was a happy memory and a vacation. The pictures on Samantha's Pinterest are about motherhood, family, all these things. They love their mother. They miss her dearly. That this children have been separated and their family has been destroyed is unconscionable. This is not... This is not how the justice system should work. This is not what the family courts are for. Okay. Um, we got about 30 seconds left, so anything you want to, I mean, that sounded pretty good there, but. I would just say I found a new um, blog online about Sandra's case. It's called Justice Number Four, Grazini Rucky Family dot WordPress okay. dot com. You can go there for more information. Okay, and, and there is a lot of information yeah. on the website, but there are some really good sources out there. Yes. That, that would be one of them. All right. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Appreciate thank it you. for that update. And we'll be following this court case as we go on. Uh, next week, A.J. Kern running for Congress will be on the show. It will be pre-recorded. Uh, she's running against Tom Emmer as uh, a Repub both Republicans uh, in the primary. It ought to be a fascinating show as to where these two people really position themselves. So remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. Days go.